Good morning and welcome to this short act of worship. Today is the seventh Sunday of Easter, or the Sunday after Ascension Day. We begin with the collect, the special prayer for today. Let us pray. O God, the King of glory, you have exalted your only Son, Jesus Christ, with great triumph to your kingdom in heaven. We beseech you, leave us not comfortless, but send your Holy Spirit to strengthen us and exalt us to the place where our Saviour Christ is gone before, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading is taken from the prophecy of Ezekiel, chapter 36, verses 24 to 28. Ezekiel 36, verses 24 to 28. The word of the Lord came to me. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries, and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. A new heart I will give you, and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove from your body the heart of stone, and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you, and make you follow my statutes, and be careful to observe my ordinances. Then you shall live in the land that I gave to your ancestors, and you shall be my people and I will be your God. This is the word of the Lord. Psalm 68, verses 1 to 10 and 33 to 36. The response to the psalm. Sing to God, O kingdoms of the earth. Sing to God, O kingdoms of the earth. Let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. Let those who hate him flee before him. Let them vanish like smoke when the wind drives it away. As the wax melts at the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. Sing to God, O kingdoms of the earth. But let the righteous be glad and rejoice before God. Let them also be merry and joyful. Sing to God, sing praises to his name. Exalt him who rides upon the heavens. Yahweh is his name. Rejoice before him. Sing to God, O kingdoms of the earth. Father of orphans, defender of widows, God in his holy habitation. God gives the solitary a home and brings forth prisoners into freedom, but the rebels shall live in dry places. Sing to God, O kingdoms of the earth. O God, when you went forth before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth shook and the skies poured down rain at the presence of God, the God of Sinai, at the presence of God, the God of Israel. Sing to God, O kingdoms of the earth. You sent a gracious rain, O God, upon your inheritance. You refreshed the land when it was weary. Your people found their home in it. In your goodness, O God, you have made provision for the poor. 
Sing to God, O kingdoms of the earth. Sing to God, O kingdoms of the earth. Sing praises to the Lord. He rides in the heavens, the ancient heavens. He sends forth his voice, his mighty voice. Sing to God, O kingdoms of the earth. Ascribe power to God, his majesty is over Israel, his strength is in the skies. How wonderful is God in his holy places, the God of Israel giving strength and power to his people. Blessed be God. Sing to God, O kingdoms of the earth. The New Testament reading is taken from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verses 6 to 14. Acts 1, verses 6 to 14. When the Apostles had come together, they asked Jesus, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel. He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up towards heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them, they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up towards heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot and Judas son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. This is the word of the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Go and make disciples of all nations, says the Lord, and remember I am with you always to the end of the age. Alleluia. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. It's John chapter 17, verses 1 to 11. Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. 
So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one, as we are one. This is the Gospel of the Lord. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I'm sure you've all experienced those times when we've been misunderstood, perhaps with unfortunate consequences. Government ministers nowadays need to be particularly careful about how they put across their views, because with all the intense press and media coverage, as well as things going viral within seconds on social media, it's so easy for what they say to be misconstrued or taken out of context. Even every diocese in the Church of England has its own communications department. And one of its roles is to make sure that anything clergy are putting out to the press or media is worded the right way so as to avoid the running the risk of someone misunderstanding what we're trying to say. And of course it can often be really frustrating when people misunderstand what you're trying to put across to them. Now we find that the apostles were all too often masters of misunderstanding. They'd heard the Lord talking a great deal about the kingdom of God during the course of his earthly ministry. But when we get to the account of the ascension at the beginning of the book of Acts, it seems that even at this stage, the apostles those chosen to be Christ's witnesses to the ends of the earth, still failed to understand all that the Lord had taught them about the price precise nature of that kingdom. It seems that they still didn't quite get it. And this misunderstanding is made plain in that question which the apostles put to Jesus. Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? It was a natural question for them to ask. They'd heard Jesus talking a lot about the kingdom, and he'd also told them that in a little while they will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. Now in the Old Testament, the prophets had foretold that the outpouring of God's Spirit would happen when God's kingdom was established. Perhaps they had in mind, for instance, our reading from Ezekiel, where the prophet speaks of God putting his spirit in his people Israel, alongside the restoration of the people 
to the promised land. So the apostles would have naturally come to the conclusion that if the Spirit was about to come, did this not mean that the kingdom too was about to be established? Hence their question. The problem though is that their question betrays a very earthly understanding of the nature of that kingdom, very different to the kingdom Jesus was actually talking about. So first of all, the apostles ask about the restoration of the kingdom, implying that they were expecting the establishment, or rather re-establishment, of a political and territorial kingdom. But the truth is that the kingdom of God isn't a geographical territory that can be located on a map but rather its character is spiritual. In his reply to the Apostle's question, the Lord speaks of the Holy Spirit coming down upon them, empowering them to be his witnesses. The exercise of power is, of course, intrinsic to any type of kingdom. But this kingdom is all about God's rule being established in the hearts and lives of his people through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is ultimately what Ezekiel's prophecy centuries earlier was pointing forward to. A new heart I will give you and a new spirit I will put within you. And God's kingdom spreads not by armed force, but by Christ's witnesses, not through a declaration of war, but through a gospel of peace, not by political intrigue or revolutionary violence, but by the work of the Spirit. As Christ's people today, we have to remember that though we're citizens of an earthly dominion, we are first and foremost citizens and indeed ambassadors of God's eternal kingdom. Our citizenship of God's kingdom must always take precedence over all other loyalties. For millions of our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world today, their citizenship of God's kingdom often brings them into sharp conflict which, with, with political regimes which stand opposed to it. And although perhaps we don't experience anything quite like that in our own country at present, there are nonetheless certain things even in our society which stand opposed to the values of the Kingdom of God. Whether it be legislation which undermines Christian moral teaching or matters of social injustice, the thing is, as kingdom people, we're called to take a stand against those things which are opposed to kingdom values. In many ways, our gospel reading this morning may be summed up in that often used phrase about Christians that we are in the world, but not of the world. Yet this is a constant challenge for us. Because it's so easy to compromise with the world, to allow in the world to turn into of the world. It's so often our natural inclination to simply go along with the crowd, to unquestioningly adopt the ways and attitudes of society at large, rather than allowing ourselves to be shaped by God's word because we are those to whom God's word has been spoken in Jesus, to whom God's name has been revealed in Jesus, and to whom God's glory has been given through Jesus. We're called to be God's holy people, a people set apart for God's needy world. Then secondly, the kingdom of God is international in its membership. 
The apostles had narrow nationalistic aspirations. They asked the Lord about restoring the kingdom specifically to Israel. But the truth is that the kingdom isn't limited by national boundaries. Yes, the Christian mission will begin in Jerusalem, their own national capital, but it will then radiate out through Samaria to the ends of the earth. In his ascension and exaltation, Christ takes his seat at the right hand of the Father, the place of all authority. All things are now subject to his rule. As the Lord declares in our Gospel reading, the Father has given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all who are willing to receive it. And so there are no barriers to fellowship in his kingdom, whether of ethnicity, nationality, social status or gender. Sadly, over the centuries and still today, people have tried to associate the kingdom of God with a particular country or people. It's the old idea of Christendom. Some Christians in the United States sincerely believe that their nation is somehow God's chosen people and that American values are synonymous with Christian values. But it's, but it's a grossly misleading assumption to make. Likewise, it's often remarked that Britain is meant to be a Christian country. But this idea too needs to be treated with some caution. Yes, there's certainly a biblical basis to our nation's laws and social thinking to a certain extent. But there's also plenty of things in our society which are far from orthodox Christian teaching. And also more, being a citizen of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland does not in any way automatically give anyone the right to call themselves a Christian. I think it's better that folk tick the no religion box on a census form rather than feel compelled to sign up to being a Christian out of a mere sense of cultural obligation. The thing is, nominal cultural Christianity is not Christianity at all. The thing is, we have to be very wary when states and political groups claim, in a sense, to speak for the kingdom of God. Because God's kingdom always remains separate from any earthly state or political ideology. In fact, it constantly poses a challenge to them. The kingdom of God can never be equated with any earthly nation. There's no such thing as a Christian equivalent of the Islamic Republic of Iran, for instance, or the, con or the concept of Hindutva, um, the idea, uh, an attempt by some prominent groups in India to make Hindu identity syn synonymous with Indian identity. Rather, God's kingdom transcends countries and cultures, embracing all those of every nation who accept Christ as their Lord and Saviour. We see this reflected most clearly in John's vision in the book of Revelation, Revelation 7-9, of that great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb of God. And then thirdly, the kingdom of God grows and expands gradually. The apostles mistakenly ask, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom? Would Jesus do now, after his resurrection, what they'd hope he would do in his lifetime? And would he do it immediately? Today we tend to be in the habit of expecting things to happen straight away. 
If you want to find out the latest news headlines, you don't ha expect to have to wait for the next day's papers to come out because you've got instant access to them through the internet, BBC News 24 or Sky News or whatever. Perhaps we've largely lost that ability to patiently wait for things. Everything needs to be immediate. But in the case of the kingdom of God, its full extent wasn't to be revealed immediately. As the Lord says to the apostles, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. The problem is we tend to find it difficult living with uncertainty. That's why there have been and continue to be plenty of well-meaning Christians who have busied themselves with trying to work out when precisely Christ will come again. We think, for instance, of the Seventh-day Adventist sect who were actually founded on the basis of a series of predictions of the Second Coming, which of course didn't come true. But the thing is, it's not for us to know the precise date and time of Christ's return. Rather, as the Lord says to the Apostles, what they should know is that they will receive power from on high, so that between the Spirit's coming at Pentecost and Christ's return in glory, they might be his witnesses to ever-increasing circles of people. As more and more people repent and believe the good news, the kingdom will stretch from shore to shore till moon shall wax and wane no more, as the hymn puts it. And this is our call to action too. As the successors of that little band of followers sharing in fellowship in the upper room in Jerusalem after the ascension, we too are called to be Christ's witnesses today. Just as the Father sent his Son into the world, so Christ in turn sends us out to be his ambassadors in the world continuing his mission through us. We're not to be preoccupied with looking upwards, gazing towards heaven. We're not going to speed his return by simply gazing into the sky, but rather beginning in the small corner of God's vineyard we called Worthing. We are to look outwards. Our calling in the power of the Holy Spirit is to further God's kingdom by what we say, by our actions, and by who we are. So as the Father is glorified in the Son, may the glory of the risen, ascended, and exalted Lord Jesus be reflected in and through our lives. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you instructed your apostles to be your witnesses to the ends of the earth upon receiving the Holy Spirit. May we be similarly inspired to joyfully spread your gospel message with your guidance and your grace. Amen. And so to a concluding prayer, and then the blessing, let us pray. Eternal God, giver of love and power, 
your Son, Jesus Christ, has sent us into all the world to preach the gospel of his kingdom. Confirm us in this mission and help us to live the good news we proclaim. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.